everybody. Welcome to yet another Arda training webinar. So tonight we're going to be talking about the interaction of stability and heel under sale. Now you may think that stability and heel are two completely different topics, but you'd be surprised how, how much both of them interact with one another. So when we're thinking about stability, that's going to have an effect on our heel. And when we're thinking about a vessel's heel, we can influence that by thinking about our vessel stability. So come and join me and we'll look a little bit more into depth about the interaction between stability and heel. So just to clear up um, before we start on the actual uh, webinar, what we're focusing on. So we're focusing on the effects of heel uh, under sale. We will introduce stability um, to aid our understanding. We're going to keep it simple. We're not going to go into too much uh, crazy detail. We won't obviously cover all of stability, but you can find a lot more stability um, in our Coastal Skipper and Yachtmaster course. Uh, so there's a huge amount of stability uh, in our safety module in them courses. We do touch on it in Day Skipper as well, but when we go to Coastal Skipper and Yachtmaster, we really ramp it up a little bit. Uh, and of course, we're going to be touching on a couple of things um, about uh, boat and sailing performance uh, this evening. Uh, and of course, there's a lot more to know about that as well. So it's just to kind of clear it up that we are going to be focusing on that kind of relationship and the effects of heel under sail and taking it back to uh, our understanding of stability. So first up, what is stability? So there's a few different uh, ways you can say it. The one I've chosen here is a measure of a vessel's ability to stay upright. Okay. Um, it can also be um, said as um, a vessel's um, desire to return to its home position. Um, its home position being when it's um, upright. So yeah, that's how we can say stability. We're just going to introduce some basic points um, about it first of all. So the basic bits of stability, um, we can get transverse or longitudinal stability. Uh, transverse stability is uh, the boat going from side to side. Longitudinal stability uh, is fore and aft. Okay. We're going to focus more on the transverse, um, side to side. Uh, the reason being is that's what's more affected um, on our vessels um, with heel, but also it's the one that we kind of have a little bit more of a say in, um, and it's the one that we can kind of um, interact with a little bit more. The governing factors are mass and buoyancy. Mass is taken as the vessel's weight, and that all acts through a central point, one point known as the center of gravity. Uh, and it's marked on uh, here by the little purple dot. And that acts downwards, that acts down to the center of the earth as all gravitational forces do, labeled here as G. Buoyancy, uh, the displacement or the water, the volume that a vessel displaces um, is the buoyancy force and it's the water pushing back up on the vessel that has um, kind of scooped out that kind of volume of water for the displacement of the vessel sitting in the water. The forces reacting on that is our buoyancy. That always acts up, upwards uh, perpendicular to the water. So here when we've got a vessel upright it, it goes straight upwards. Buoyancy and mass they always act in the same plane so one's one acts upwards and one, one acts downwards. Moving on, if our vessel was to lean over a little bit, and we're going to get on to how that happens in a little bit, but if our vessel was to heel over, then what happens is, is the buoyancy force moves out towards the side where the vessel has healed. But that is because the profile of our vessel in the water has changed. So we're, we're creating a different displacement. And so that has changed where our buoyancy force acts. Whereas our mass, our center of gravity, is still in the same place because that is just the weight of the vessel and that stays in the same place unless we were to move a weight around the vessel. So for the, all intents and purposes of looking at stability, 
mass, center of gravity stays in the same spot. So we've got that by the red dot on our vessel here, and the buoyancy with the blue dot, buoyancy acting upwards, gravity acting downwards, and what's happening? They're trying to create this turning force. This is known as our writing moment, and you can see that the force is trying to turn that vessel back upright, okay? We can measure the writing moment, however, and that is a product of the distance between where our center of gravity is and where our buoyancy force acts through, uh, multiplied by our boat's mass. So uh, yeah, simple, simple kind of lever arm. And if you go back to like, maybe your childhood memories of being in the play park and you're on the seesaw, uh, that's all it is. It's a big lever arm. So if you're sitting at the end of the seesaw, you can create so much more force to pop the seesaw up one way or the other. Whereas if you're sitting more to the center, then you, you have to work so much harder with your legs to push up from your side. That's all that's happening with the writing moment here. The more a vessel leans, the more that that, um, at that point where the buoyancy acts on the vessel is going to change. And we can show that with a stability curve. And what it basically happens on the stability curve is if we look at the x-axis, which is a horizontal axis here, we've got angle of heel. And we look at the y-axis, which is the vertical axis, and we've got writing moment. As angle of heel starts to increase, the writing moment increases. So as our vessel starts to lean over, that buoyancy force gets pushed further and further out to the side of the vessel until it get, reaches its maximum point and the vessel keeps healing over, keeps healing over, and our buoyancy force starts to come back towards the center or back towards where our center of gravity is. And at some point, it's going to be in the same line as our center of gravity again. So we're gonna have buoyancy acting upwards, gravity acting downwards in the same line. And then it's gonna go the other side as the vessel is now round at 150 degrees. So, you know, we're almost upside down. And then these forces are now trying to work together to turn the boat upside down. So what that writing moment is doing is, or the, the creation of that writing moment from the vessel healing allows us to view it all on this stability curve. And this is what we're always going to be thinking back to um, this evening, because this is going to have a big factor in dealing with heel. Okay, so just wanted to do that little brief bit on stability without doing a whole lesson on it, just so we've got a little understanding on it. Now, why is it important? Well, every vessel is going to have different characteristics. And so every vessel is going to have a different stability curve based on factors that we can't change you'll learn that there are some factors we can change, but basically when a vessel gets built, it will be given stability characteristics and the designers will work out for the various angles of heel, what is the writing moment, and then they'll produce a stability curve for it. So we need to know what that is for each vessel that we're sailing on. So that's why it's pretty important. Now, what factors can change on the different vessels to change this um, stability curve or our writing moment? Hull type is going to be a big one, um, but also weight, draft, even shape, uh, and even other design characteristics of the boat as well. But if we just keep it a little bit simple for just now, wide versus narrow. So the, the red boat here in the little diagram in the middle of the slide, that is a big wide boat whereas the blue one at the bottom is a narrow boat. For the same angle of heel, look at where the buoyancy is. On the red boat, the buoyancy uh, force is acting way out further to the side, meaning that the writing moment is much greater at that angle of heel on the wide vessel than it is on the narrow vessel, okay? That's gonna have an impact later on, as we'll see on our stability curves. We can also even look at shallow versus deep. What difference is that gonna make? Well, if you've got a shallow drafted vessel, your center of gravity might actually be a little bit higher 
than the same vessel with a deeper draft because they can get the weight much lower down thanks to um, the keel. Put all the weight in the bottom of the keel and you'll lower your centre of gravity. As you lower the centre of gravity, you can increase that distance between your mass and buoyancy where they act um, for this stability. Heavier vessels, again, are going to possibly or generally um, have lower centre of gravities and again the shape of the vessel can impact it as well. So there's many things to see and if we just have a quick glance at the picture on the right hand side here we've got two vessels. One on the left hand vessel is a modern cruiser and the right hand vessel was built in the 80s um, so it's kind of a little bit more of a dated um, model. They don't actually sit perfectly into the diagrams in the middle, but you can probably see that the vessel on the left is bigger. It looks like it's a little bit wider. It's a lot wider, uh, but it's also got a deeper draft as well. And so that's going to have a lot more um, initial stability because that writing moment, as soon as that vessel starts to lean over, that writing moment, the buoyancy is just going to shoot out to the side. and It's going to have a really great writing moment. Whereas the other vessel, very shallow drafted, it's going to have a slightly higher center of gravity in comparison between the two boats. And it's much narrower as well. So as soon as it starts to, to lean, it's not going to quite get that same change of buoyancy force. So you can have two vessels, one, one of them's 44 foot, one of them's 45 foot. They're almost the same vessel, but they, uh, they can have very different um, characteristics. And that's why we want to know in advance what stability characteristics each vessel has that we go sailing on. Now I've got a few other pictures here. Um, I'm not going to spend too long chatting to them, but if we start on the top right, that's actually the same vessel that I just said on the previous one that was the, the wider one with the deeper draft. And you can see it now in the hoist, how wide it is, super wide. Now we're going to learn later on how while I'm saying that that's good, as soon as it leans over, that buoyancy force is gonna shoot out to the side. There's also other reasons that it might not be so good as well. So I just thought I'd just throw in the picture where we can. The one below that, the boat named Breeze there, you can see, again, quite a narrow boat, but a very deep draft, okay? Um, so that's gonna be good for lowering that center of gravity down. Bottom left hand corner, that's actually Mifa, and I think that's probably uh, Ed and Charlie underneath it, redoing the antifoul. Uh, but again, it's just to show the different characteristics of the vessel. Mifa's got, again, shallow draft compared to modern vessels, much narrower as well. And we'll touch on this later on, but look at where the waterline ends, which is just below the big red stripe. And it actually goes angled right up as well. So they've still got a lot of boat that actually isn't in the water. So that's another thing that can influence what we're going to be discussing. And when you think back to that picture at the end of the night, you'll have a bit more idea of as to where that design came from. And finally, the picture in the top left, it's a Clipper 60. So this vessel was designed to sail around the world. It's what it was built for, basically. And you would imagine that it's going to have amazing stability characteristics. But for anyone who has done a little bit of stability knowledge already, the AVS, which is the angular bashing stability of that boat, is 113 degrees, which is really not very big at all. That means that once that vessel goes over to 113 degrees, it will keep going and turn upside down. And one of the factors of that is look how shallow she is. She's barely got any draft. In fact, she's got less draft than the boat in the top right, which is 16 foot shorter. So uh, yeah, lots of different boats, gonna have many different characteristics. And it's not quite as simple as saying, there's a stability curve. That's what one looks like. Every vessel is gonna follow that. But I've been talking about stability for a while, so I probably should move on. What is heel? Okay, so in the same question we asked for what is stability, what is heel? Heel is the angle from the center line that a vessel is leaning over thanks to an external force. What's, what's an external force going to be? 
wind, waves, that kind of thing. What is not heel? So maybe there's a work boat out there and they've got a little crane sitting on it and you see the vessel just sitting over to one side. That's not heel, that's list. So it's important to not get them too confused. Heel is always from an external force. When we go sailing on our sailing boats, our vessels heel. The wind blows, even without our sails up, if the wind blows side on, our vessel is going to lean over. But as soon as we put our sails up, that's creating a massive area for that external force to act on and heel our vessel over. Why is heel important? So what we're doing is we're just answering a few questions here and we're building up into kind of answering the whole question um, at once at the end. But the more a vessel heals, the lesser its performance. Okay, now this is quite important at any time, but it does come back to us at this stage because it shows us why it's important to think about the stability and the heel together. So the more a vessel heals, the lesser its performance. So the waterline length. Now, on modern vessels, certainly those built in the last 20 years or so, when we heal, we typically reduce our waterline. So as the vessel leans over, our waterline length actually reduces. Now that's not ideal. Why is that not ideal? Because the longer a vessel's waterline length is, the faster it will move through the water. Now this is true for various objects, and this could go off into a tangent of lots of physics, but just to give you another example of that, if anyone's ever watched NASCAR racing, I always like this one as a good example, they're going around on the track and they're going around the circle and then what they do is they get two cars in a line and the two cars keep going around together and they go faster because they're making a bigger air pocket for the two cars to go through. Same as cyclists drafting off each other. Well, it's kind of the same physical principle. Not exactly because we're dealing with different volumes. We've got air versus water. But yeah, the longer a vessel is, typically the faster it'll go through the water. Now, the vessel in the picture here is IOR Maxi, International Offshore Rule Maxi, built in the 80s. And what they did is they had to try and build their boats to fit into a box rule. So what they did was they actually made their measured waterline length shorter, but as soon as the vessel started sailing, it would go longer. So in some vessels that are designed that way, it's actually beneficial to create some heel because your vessel will go short, will go faster. Obviously, designs rules change, different factors influence it, such as having more volume inside your vessel for multiple cabins uh, and things change. But I thought I'd just touch on that one because yeah, it's a good one for thinking about why a vessel might be designed in a certain way. But yeah, as we heal, we change our waterline length. Also when we heal, um, we change our buoyancy. Why is that? Because when we heal, we cause a different hull profile to interact with the water. So not only do we shift that buoyancy, um, the position where the buoyancy acts, but we actually can also change it, not just moving it to the side, but moving it fore and aft as well. Now, modern cruisers, like we're saying, very wide at the back. It's not a great picture here, but I was trying to find one that showed me, and it's ex again, it's the same boat that we'd looked at earlier on with the blue hull, the one that was in the, uh, the hoist. Now, if you look carefully at the bottom of the picture, you can see the the water line and the black antifoul at the bottom and then the blue of the hull. There's a lot more black antifoul towards the back of the boat. Now why is that? That's because they're so wide at the back that as they lean over that buoyancy force shifts aft and it pushes the bow down. Okay, Which isn't great for many reasons but it's just also totally affected the difference uh, um, of how our stability is acting with the vessel, with our bow down, 
we're going to be bouncing into the waves a lot more. It's going to kill our speed. And depending on how much you're, you're leaning over and how much the bow is down and the wind conditions, it can even um, change the helming characteristics of the vessel. So uh, yeah, healing can change our buoyancy position. The more we heal over, the less our sails will be presented to the wind. So you imagine I've got my sail here in my hand and it leans over, there's less area between here and here now that are kind of in that bit there that are interacting with the wind. So the more we heal, the less area of sail we have to propel us from the wind. So in theory, we would lose speed. Looking at the picture on the right, Technically, the flatter we are, the faster we will go because we'll have a better sail area presented to the wind. That might not be the case with this particular picture that I've selected here, but I felt it was quite a good example of they're losing the wind. You can see the sail. The, the wind isn't on that mainsail there. They, they, they would want to... Well, if you look at actually the water, it's not actually that windy. There's not really any white crests. They've probably just rounded up towards the wind here. But they want to get the boat down away from the wind, get that main sheeted back in again, and they would actually be going faster and, and more under control. You can also probably see as well a little bit in this that the stern's actually quite high out the water as well. So they're probably getting an influence of that buoyancy as the heels moving that buoyancy back and it's pushing the bow down, which has probably helped for force them to round up to the wind. Um, so that heels have been causing all sorts of problems with that vessel there. But basically, the flatter we are, the, the better our sail area is in its presentation to the wind and the faster we will go. But I'm sure you're already asking, what does heel have to do with stability? Our stability curve details how much force is needed to heal our boat. So at the moment, we've just talked about stability and heel separately. We're now going to bring that together a little bit and have a look back at our stability curve again. Now, what I've got here in the picture is two stability curves. We've got a red, a red curve from our previous wide-bodied vessel and a blue curve from our narrow or deeper drafted uh, vessel. Understanding our stability curves can help guide us to know how to control our heel. So that's quite an important sentence to throw in there. What I've shaded on the, on the stability curve here is the force required to get to an angle of heel of 45 degrees. Now the area of that shaded area, blue and red, is the force required to get to the angle of heel. So for the blue curve, it's, I mean, we're not quantifying any numbers here, but for the blue curve, it's probably about a quarter, a third, definitely less than a third, the force required to get to that heel, angle of heel, as is for the red curve. It's got such a more pronounced curve there, and for the red boat to heel over to 45 degrees, it needs so much more external force to act on the vessel. So that is why stability is so important for, to, to compare or to be aware of when you're thinking about your vessel's heel. If you had the two vessels side by side, and you put them in the same amount of wind, then the blue vessel would have to reef so much earlier than the red vessel because if they, if they receive the same amount of wind, the blue vessel is going to heel over so much quicker and so it's going to lose that performance. Whereas the red vessel can actually hold on to its um, lower heel for a much longer time. Okay. Now, every vessel will be different, as we said. But what it means is if we improve our vessel stability, we will reduce our heel. If we reduce our heel, 
we increase our performance and we get to where we want to go more efficiently. Everybody's a winner, okay? And it all comes from understanding about how your vessel stability curve sits. And so can you use that to understand at what point are you going to be healing over too much? Or do you, can you carry more sail or less sail? Or is there something that you want to do, something else you want to do to reduce heal? So every vessel stability curve is going to affect our sail choice. So reducing heal... So the more we reduce heel, the greater our vessel's performance. And the more we lower our center of gravity, the greater our writing moment will be. And so the more force required to heel to a certain point, and so the greater our vessel's performance. So yeah, if we can lower our COG, we will need more force to get to a certain heel. And so we've, by just lowering our COG, we've improved our vessel's performance. If I just pop back to the heel, um, if we can reduce our heel, we, we improve our vessel's performance. So that's why we're thinking about heel and stability together. Now, the following factors we're going to touch on, they affect or can be affected by both heel and stability. And that's why you want to think about the two of them together, basically. So we'll get to them. Let's just get to the first one straight away. Crew weight. So if we stick all our crew on one side, that actually shifts our center of gravity. But I bet you probably thought if we stick all our crew on one side, it reduces our heel. But it reduces our heel because it changes our center of gravity, okay? Now that is a movable weight. And if we took everybody from off the side of the boat, we're, we're not gonna have that, you know, the center of gravity is gonna pop back into the middle of the boat. The little diagram there kind of shows what's happening in the picture. So our buoyancy force is where it is. We put all our bodies on the side of the vessel and look, the center of gravity has shifted out a little bit. Because the center of gravity has shifted out a bit, the writing moment has increased. So it reduces our heel. Now, we would, this picture was just for a, a little bit of fun. On that particular vessel, we, it's probably not going to make much difference. That vessel weighed 45 tons. I was going to say, maybe it probably would make a little difference. You've got 10 people sitting on the side. So that's a ton. So it might make a small difference. But if you think to your racing yachts, this one here, there's nobody up on the side. If they were all up on the side there, that vessel wouldn't be leaning over as much because they would have affected the center of gravity. And that's what typically happens. That, that boat's in a race at the, at the moment there. And that's what typically happens on racing boats. And uh, that's why... You've always got everybody who's out doing racing uh, on racing boats, looking for more crew and getting the crew up on the side because it increases their performance, because they reduce heel, because they've changed their center of gravity. Other factors, roller reefing versus hanks. So most of you out there, if you've charted the boat before, or if you're going to go and do your day skipper practical, or you have your own vessel, you probably have roller reefing sails on those vessels. Roller reefing sails are great. They allow us to just roll the sail away, get it out of the way, roll it out. It's minimal effort. However, it does mean that we always have extra weight higher up. Extra weight higher up raises our center of gravity, which means when we go to lean over, it reduces our writing moment. So the top picture here, both of those head sails, the Yankee and the stay sail, they're hanked on. So we've actually got a smaller Yankee on. I think it's probably the Yankee 2 we have on at that point. So we've managed to lower our sail force, or sorry, reduce our sail area, but by lowering the sail force as well. And um, you can probably just see right at the bottom at the front of the foredeck, there's another sail there. Um, that will probably be our number three or our number one. 
And by doing that, by keeping the sail down, it does two things. It lowers the center of gravity because you've got the sail weight lower, but also the sail size, and you'll see one in a minute that's very different, the tack of that sail is right down on the deck rather than the tack of the sail being halfway up the forestay. Um, so that means that the center of effort on that sail is much lower as well, which reduces the writing moment of that external force leaning over um, to be closer down to the center of gravity too, um, which is handy. But I don't want to get into too much of extra sail trim and balance and stuff like that, but do want to touch on it a little bit. We can't influence this when we're going out for a day sail. We can't influence this when we're going out on our charter vessel. They will either have one or the other, but it's still important to think about it. And if you're going to buy your own vessel to perhaps sail around the world or to sail offshore, then maybe it's something you want to think about. Hanks versus roller reefing. Stowage. So another basic stability feature that we can influence. So this is mainly all influencing our center of gravity. Keep everything low. Keep your spare anchor chain in, in the bottom center of your boat. Don't keep it where you see in the top picture here. That's in the cockpit locker. We've got a big kedge anchor there. I've got some chain, extra warp. I've also got two massive 20 liter barrels of water. So you've got about 100, 150 kilos, depending on how much anchor chain's in that box there, extra higher up that doesn't need to be there. That could all be kept down below the floorboards and it would help in the stability of that vessel by lowering the center of gravity. And bottom right picture, you've got the batteries. They're actually below the floorboards there. That's great. Center of the boat, heavy batteries, low down, out the way, increases our stability by lowering our center of gravity. Now, this, this we can influence when we're going on to our boat. Let's say you're going on for a week's trip or even a month or a year. You're probably gonna take on some extra food, some storage, some water, some drinks, all the heavy things, get them low down. The lower you get all those tins, the better it's gonna be for your vessel. It might not seem much, but every little is gonna help. Reefing is gonna have a big impact on your heel. Don't be afraid to reef early. It will actually make you go faster. So that's coming back to our heel. The less we heel, the faster we go. You'll heel less if you have a reefed sail. Now you don't want to go out there and sail around with a reef in at all times. You need to use your sailing knowledge to know when that's gonna happen. But I got a couple of pictures in here, the bottom, the bottom one and the right hand picture, you can see that the, the reefs are in the sails. The right one does look pretty windy, so you'd expect a reef to be in. The bottom left, quite a small picture I know, but it just not, doesn't look like there's many white crests on the water, so it's probably not actually that windy, but there's still a reef in, still a little bit of heel on the boat. So by reducing that heel, we're just improving our performance. Now, when to reef? Every vessel is going to be different. You need to think about, okay, what is the start of my stability curve like? Does it go up really high and sharp or does it go off at a very narrow, lower angle? If it goes up really high at the start, you probably don't need to reef for a while. Whereas if it goes off nice and low, you're probably thinking 10, 12 knots, I need to stick my first reef in. The top left, it's actually not reefed. If you look at them really closely and the guy on the helm, I just threw this one in just to kind of touch on a tangent. The guy on the helm there, I think he's almost steering it with two fingers, okay? That's how it should be. If you're really working your wheel and your boat's leaning over, you need to reef. You're already overpowered. Your boat should be balanced up. When you do reef your sails, make sure you balance your sails and I hope Ed can tell us a little bit about what's happening in this picture. Yeah, so I think what Stu's referring to here, this is Song of the Whale, um, which I've sailed many tens of thousands of miles in various parts of the world. Um, but what he's referring to is how we constantly adapt and we got three sails on this boat, a main sail, a stay sail and a Yankee. And you're constantly playing with the free sails to try and get the balance. Because basically, you know, if if we were to put all the Yankee away, 
um, and not reef the mainsail accordingly to match, then you'll find the boat's just turning into the wind uh, at every opportunity. It's constantly being pulled up to point into the wind because all that pressure's further back on the boat and it's turning the stern of the boat, pulling the boat up. And likewise, if we um, if we were to say, well, it's easier to just go in a head sail sometimes, uh, easier to furl and unfurl rather than reefing the main sail. If we were to drop all the main and just go under the head sails, the opposite's happening. All the weight's on the front of the boat and it's pushing the boat downwind. So, I mean, you can see here we've got, you can't see the main sail. I, th I think there's there's possibly four reefs in that, maybe three, I think, three or four. Um and then we've got the full stay sail, and then we just got a little bit of head sail, and we'll have just been playing, putting a little bit in, putting a little bit out, making it so that the boat is basically wanting to steer in a straight line by itself, minimise the amount of work for the helmsman. Cool. Thanks, Ed. Did you want me to drop back to any of the other bits that you wanted to add to before I go forward? No, not particularly. Um, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of minutes longer if you want. No, no. I mean, I'm, I'm easy. Whatever. What one thing I was going to say is just a. I don't know. I think it's a funny story when you were saying about how the boat will often sail more efficiently if you if you're bringing it upright. If you're reefing your sails, sailing more upright. Upright. We. I was actually sailing quite a few. Uh, again, a few thousand miles with a guy, and he he'd done quite a lot of sailing. He had his own boat, and at the end of the trip, he stopped and he said, "I really learned something important on this trip." He said, "When I sail my own boat, I thought you only reef the sails um, if you're a, a wuss, basically, it's like to make it more comfy, or maybe you want to go to the toilet." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I just go everywhere with full sails. <laughs> um, and he absolutely did not appreciate that he thought sailing sporty, leaning over, going fast, didn't appreciate at all that actually you can just do everything so much more efficiently upright. <laughs> and it's all about, you know, making your boat go efficiently rather than um, leaning over and making yourself feel like a sporting superstar <laughs> and and the other one was um, when you were talking about moving the crew to the side of the boat and you're saying they do it on racing boats quite a lot you shovel your crew up on the windward rail and actually that's something i realized once when we were unloading um a, a ton of batteries off of off of a boat and we, at one point in the process of getting them off, we moved them from one side of the boat to the other. And it became so apparent that actually it's two tons of weight you're moving because all those people on the rail, if they weren't on the rail, they'd be somewhere else. And if you're heeled over, everyone nestle, nestles down in the leeward side because it's the most comfortable. You'll sort of always end up cradled in your bunker in a, in a, in a seat. So actually sticking them on the window rail, it, has double the effect it moves them from the leeward side onto the windward side um, and yeah it's more like moving two times rather than one yeah actually just when you were saying that about moving um the battery weights it reminded me we did actually do i was on a boat once when we did a stability uh, calculation and we used weights to move around the boat to see how it was affected by weights but also to take off the list to make sure that you know whatever the the minus the the minuscule amount of list was on the vessel, yeah, they used weights and it was in, yeah pretty interesting for all of that yeah. as well. Um, just on the reefing one as well, a kind of similar thing to Ed's. I always remember um, racing in dinghies when I was younger, and we went to this one race weekend, and the I can't remember what number it was, but it was something like six six boats reefed um whereas we were all like ah you don't need to reef we're all heavy we'll just get out and keep the boat flat and who were the first six or seven boats to finish the ones that reefed when you do reef and you want to reduce your power so that you can reduce your heel you want your sails to be as flat as possible the number of times i see boats reefed 
and then have a big saggy main sail and a big saggy foot along the sail, that increases the power. You may as well have taken that reef out and done the first one properly and you would have the same amount of power on your sail. So make sure your outhaul and your halyard are super tight um, so that you can get everything on your sail as flat as possible. What about motor? I thought I'd better just touch on this a little bit. So motor vessels will still heal. We just have a lot fewer variables that we can change on motor vessels, such as our sails. And, but it's still important to consider our stability curve to understand what's happening. Now, the thing that's going to make your motor vessel heal is your superstructure, your, your, like your cabin and, and anything that's above deck level, and even the top sides as well, depending on how big they are on your motor vessel. They will all um, make vessels heal. If anyone's ever been on a, like a big ferry and it's windy, you'll notice that she still leans to one side or another. That's heel that's causing that. So it does still matter on... Uh, motor boats. I just kind of made this one to be more about um, sail because it's kind of something that we can actually impact quite a lot as well. So bringing it all back together, combining our knowledge of stability and heel can improve our sailing. Okay, so what is our stability curve for a boat? How is that going to impact how quickly or slowly our vessel heels over when an external force like the wind acts on it? Think about that and that corresponding knowledge and we will become better and more efficient um, sailors. And just to kind of recap on it, if we want to increase stability, so we can do that by, by lowering our centre of gravity, we can use hanked on sails, we can lower the weight and we can think about the boat's characteristics. Um, now, by that, I mean, what, what can we change on the boat or, or what the boat is going to do that we can kind of influence a little bit? So is she going to lean over and change that buoyancy point, in which case then we want to try and avoid that happening? Or is she going to kind of or are we going to take too much weight and lower the center of gravity too much? And upset our whole stability as well. So we were just discussing where we came on before we came on tonight about vessels with extra bits of lead um, stuck in them. So uh, yeah, you don't want to do that. That that's going to upset your vessel's stability. So don't try and mess around with it, other than lowering your weight and keeping it to the center. I put pop this picture up, and it thought about another thing for me for the boat's characteristics. And that's the fact of the boat being having two masts. When you have two masts, your weight lowers because you've not got the weight up for a taller mast. But also the forces, the external forces trying to lean her over are acting lower as well. So, yeah, your, um, your catches and your schooners and your clipper vessels with the double head sails. And they're all going to allow you to, 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 to bring all the factors closer together, closer to the centre of gravity, which in turn increases your stability. And how do we reduce our heel? So, like we were just saying, moving our crew around, as Ed was saying, can, that can make double the difference. Putting the crew onto the high side and rigging your boat, not to the conditions, but to your boat's characteristics. So a lot of people ask me when we're on a day skipper course, for instance, when should I reef? And it is around that 10, 12 knot mark that your average vessel wants to pop a reef in. But there is no rule of thumb of you must reef at this stage, put a second reef in at however many knots, change down a head sail size, roll some of it away at this. Every vessel is going to be different. So you need to know your boat's characteristics and change your sail plan according to that. Just because you were out on one boat one weekend and it was 16 knots and you had two reefs in the stay sail, the next weekend you might be on something that's a lot fatter, has that much higher stability curve, and you might be able to hold full sail in 16 knots, especially if you pop your crew up on the high side. These are the factors that you can use. Sorry, Ed. 
I'd say I'd, I'd add to that as well. It's it's not so simple as ever having a a, um, a list of on this boat you must put this reef in at this wind speed because the wind speed isn't the only variable. Uh, is how heavily loaded the boat is, which changes throughout the duration of a of a charter or holiday or a trip as your water and your fuel decreases. It also depends on the sea conditions, which change a lot as well. So it really is down to you as the skipper to take notice, to understand your vessel. You can't just read it out of a book. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Ed. And just touching on these two slides here, these are our two things that we can combine together thinking about our stability and thinking about our heel. If you can't do anything about your stability, then you need to focus on the heel to bring, you know, so you can work together to reduce heel or true in the high side. That is essentially changing your stability because you're changing your, um, your center of gravity, shifting variables around. If you're on a very long passage, can you shift those spare sails up to the windward side? I was actually on a boat once where we could shift the water from one side to another. We had a port tank and a starboard tank, so whenever we tacked, we could drop the water into the low side, shut the valve, tack, and all the water was then on the high side. So yeah, real cool, simple contraption. But you may be out on your own. There may just, just be you and your partner, and so you can't put your crew on the high side. And you might not be able to constantly keep changing the sails, changing from a number two to a number three. It might just be you have your one sail. Of course, you can put your reefs in and out, but you can't change too much. You can't start moving things around. You've not got the control, as Ed says, of maybe moving the water. In that case, you need to think about how do I affect my stability curve? Okay, we can put all our heavy equipment down low if we're going on a long voyage with just the two of us. Do we consider a different boat with characteristics that are going to increase our stability? So it's about combining them and thinking what works for you. So uh, thanks very much. I hope I haven't bored you too much. And I hope you've learned a little bit about why stability and heel are actually a lot more interacted than you maybe thought originally. Stuart, thanks for that. A uh, really, really good lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, my question was about the ABSs. On your diagram between the red and the blue yachts, the ABSs were, were different. Um, how much do, should we actually worry about ABSs when we're sort of considering yachts, you know, in the future? Over? So it's a very important factor to consider, but it also... It's probably not your main consideration when, certainly not when charting a boat, but probably not even your main consideration when buying one, unless you are thinking about sailing it into some pretty rough seas or some pretty crazy weather. That is because there's so many other characteristics about your vessel that are going to be more important to you. So let's say you're going to buy a vessel to sail around the world then you're going to be spending a lot more time on your vessel at anchor and exploring coral reefs and stuff like that than you are um, out in 20 plus knots of wind when your ABS is going to be kind of a little bit more important. It is still important. The difference in them on that curve is goes a little bit more into the deeper side of stability in that the vessel that has really good initial stability so it's got that high curve to begin with, it will then have poorer ultimate stability, which means it goes through that ABS point earlier. I think it's important to know it does change it a little bit in the fact of how you would potentially affect your stability, but it's probably talking about minuscule points. But I wouldn't go out there and be like, I need an AVS of 145 or above. Certainly not if you're sailing around the Mediterranean, say. Not to say that you don't get windy conditions or wavy conditions there, um, but I don't think it's going to be the, the deciding factor for you. The higher the AVS, though, the more likely, if you did turn upside down, 
that your vessel then pops back up the right way. And where do I'd most... Say... Oh, sorry, Ed. Sorry, go on. I was just going to say, where do most vessels turn upside down? In the Southern Ocean. So if you're going to sail in the Southern Ocean, it's probably something to really consider. But if not, I'd probably just think about all the other aspects. Yeah, I, w- I was thinking of... Depending on depending on what you're doing, but the the bigger one, I guess, is is is, is your if you're in the conditions where you might expect your boat to have the op- the possibility of rolling over, which does happen. I mean, look at the Golden Globe race, where you've got 35 foot boats sailing around the world in the Southern Ocean. Those guys put seatbelts on their bunks and they know there's a chance they're going to roll over, like a bigger chance than normal that they're going to get rolled. But they've all got super high ABS and they know the boat will roll all the way and pop back up. Um, if I was going in a 30 foot, 35 foot catamaran where it's got a huge amount of effort to turn it, but once, but it gets to like 90 degrees and then it goes over and it never comes back up again. You know that's different, but I mean that's such extreme scenarios. Um, it's more just I think understanding what boat you've got, what its limitations are, or what to expect. Even you know some boats might heel over quicker, sooner. Um, but if you know it's got a high ABS, you know if you need to expect that, you know just to reef a bit earlier, and it's 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 okay. You can handle it. The main, th- I mean, the ma- if you've got your full sail out on a roller reefing, in theory, your there's no extra sail weight higher up. However, there is your roller reefing equipment, so you've got like a little like, thing at the bottom drum. Well, you've got one at the bottom, but you've also got one at the top of the mast as well. So that's a little bit of extra weight right at the very top of the mast. Um, also. The way that the sail attaches on is it's got a foil which goes on to the actual wire stay and that foil runs up the whole length of the stay so that that adds a little bit of weight on as well. If you've ever held on to the foil, they're actually quite heavy so that's adding weight all the way up and down your foil whereas you you just had a stay and hanks to clip on um, you've not actually got that extra weight but you do have a lot of extra work to hoist a sail up and pull it out. I think when you get to the stage of reducing your sail for reducing your heel, you're already wanting to reduce the power anyway, so you want your sail to be lower. But yes, the higher up you go, the windier it is. You've got a different wind strength 10 meters above the sea level than on the sea level. Um, so yeah, the, the basic physics of that is the same. But at that stage of I'm wanting to reduce the sail, you're already wanting to reduce the power. So by having it lower down is actually reducing your power. Your effective force on the sail will will lower. And that's what you want because that's going to make you heal less. Keels and certain keels actually are actual aerofoil shapes. So the same top of your wing would be the same as both sides of your keel. So your keel actually does create a lift, um, but it creates a lift both both ways. The more you heel, the less the keel does its job though. So you touched on it stopping the boat from going sideways. The more you heel, the less that keel is doing its job. I... I used to sail with someone a couple of a couple of weeks a year. We'd go to their um, sort of family's place in North Wales, and they had loads of dinghies. They had loads of dinghies. We used to play in a estuary just in from Harlech, and on one of their dinghies, on their mirror dinghy, this much loved old thing, they had converted it to have two lee boards rather than rather than its usual setup because it's very shallow and one thing that I was toying with there was because he had two lee boards and you'd only have one at a time lee boards are for those of you maybe not certain you 
bolted to the side of the boat took one on either side and we'd drop the leeward side one on and keep the other one up so we'd have one in the water but as the boat healed it would put it sort of straight down maximum effects but that we really could shape each one for each tack so you could really get that wing shape onto each lee board to give you extra pull forwards created by by your lee board which obviously you can't really do for a keel because you've got one keel and it has to do for both tacks so it's not as effective but um I thought it was a fun little experiment anyway. <laughs> Touch on um, what we now have in the sailing world with the foiling vessels as well. Yeah. And our foils create lift. If you go back to, I can't remember what year it was. It was when the, was it the Kiwis or the, no, it was the Aussies went and won the America's Cup from the Americans for the first time was it early eighties, and they and the they had the winged keel and they kept it all under wraps, right up until literally they had to see it on the. I don't even know if they could see it on the first launch. They launched it with it was all in wraps, and that was because it was creating lift and allowing their vessel to go faster because there was less drag. And I'm pretty sure there's a film about it on Netflix, which I would recommend watching that'll be right up uh was it christopher's last question there that'll be right up your street if you haven't already seen it i'll try and remember the name of it and we'll pop it on our forum thanks everybody for joining us thanks for the questions um thanks for the homework uh christopher <laughs> yeah it's great thanks i i like to think i learn something new every day and definitely definitely picked up a couple of reinforced a couple of things where that i'll think about more in the future so uh i really enjoyed it anyway it looks like a few of the others did too <laughs> cracking all right thanks everyone Yo, night everybody okay charlie when the house bears about 270 degrees information to work out our distance from the lighthouse and use that we might be perfectly on track, but if we're not on time... Let's have a look. I've got my phone here at the effect it has on our steering compass. So our echo sound is working. We can find a contour and follow it nicely into port. Our left hand is pointing towards the centre of the low. 